This episode is sponsored by Unexpected Games. Episode 32 of the Board Game Geek Podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm super excited to be here today with Tim from the Board Game Hot Takes Podcast. How's it going today, Tim? It's going awesome, Candace. I'm so happy to be here. The only problem with being here is that I don't get to hear your awesome intro music, but when I listen back later, I'll get to hear it. <laughs> And for listeners, I don't know if Candace ever mentioned this before, but I just confirmed that that is her vocals on that track. So just so you know, when you hear that awesome intro music, that's Candace singing. Aww, so that was really thank cool. You, Tim. <laughs> made, made my day to learn that. But yeah, otherwise things are going awesome. Um, it's beautiful here. I live in Phoenix and the weather is finally cool enough where we're out biking and running outside and, and doing outdoor activities for the first time for several months. So things are going great with me. That is awesome. And your I love I love your podcast title by the way board game hot takes it's it's so good. <laughs> I, I wish I felt the same way about it to be honest because <laughs> really? yeah so the funny thing is is so when we first came up with the idea for that me my friend Adam hit me up we were playing board games this was like right after pandemic started and we started playing board games online together and at, at one point we would get done playing a game and we just start talking about it so he's like and we both listen to podcasts like why don't we just start recording our own podcast. So yeah. I quickly wrote up an email, threw out some ideas to him and said, how about if we just do an immediate discussion right after a game and we'll call it something like board game hot takes. And he didn't respond to the name, so I could tell he didn't like it. But the next day we recorded <laughs> our first one to test it. And I just used that because I hadn't come up with another name. Yeah. And then we just kept using it and we all hate it. But um, Oh my but, goodness, you know. I love it. <laughs> Well, I think the problem is that I think for some people, they, they hear board game hot takes and they think we're trying to bring in like controversial, you know, conversations oh, or topics. Yeah. But my intent was just that it's like an immediate reaction. And so, you know, it works. Like we actually, we talked about changing it on the show at one point. We even pulled our listeners to see if they liked any other names, but they hated all the other names we suggested. So we just stuck with it eventually. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny because I, I think it's a, a great name and it's like... Uh, you know, at times when I was thinking of a a title for something board, you know, whether whether it's a blog or something else, I think board game hot takes is great. Um, so I like it. <laughs> uh, nice. The, the important part for me was that it's got board game in the name. So people can organically find us when they're just searching for board game podcasts. It's one of the first one that shows up. So I think it worked from that perspective, at least. That's cool. What have you guys recently like reviewed on there? So our, our last couple of review episodes is we did Age of Innovation and we did Nucleum. Nice. So that was those were our full reviews. Two cool. amazing games. If you like yes. heavier games, you gotta gotta check those out. I just played Nucleum again this week and still love it. But we've also been doing a variety of other content. We just did a series of episodes called Board Games as Stories, where we kind of looked at the structure of a story and how that applied in board games. So in other words, like, you know, in a story, you've cool. got your intro, you've got the build up, you've got the climax, and then you've got the conclusion in a story. And so we did four different episodes where the first one we looked at, what are our, our, the top five games that have great intros? You know, we're like right from the start, you really get pulled oh, yeah. into the game, et cetera. And that was a really fun series to think through and record. So that's that's some recent stuff we did. We just recorded a mailbag, up, our first ever mailbag episode on Monday night too where we got some listener questions and that was a, real, a lot of fun topics that we wouldn't have thought of to discuss. Oh, so, cool. you know, we do a variety of stuff on there. That's, that's pretty cool. I know I listened to your, uh, your revive episode when I was on my uh, binging of content for revive when I was all obsessed with playing it. <laughs> Good. Stuff. Yeah. Revive is a great one because it's it's funny, like, I think a lot of people think, well, you can't review something if you haven't played it five or six or eight times or whatever. But we tend to just, you know, some games we played a lot, but most of them we just, we discuss right after playing it. Hot and takes, it's shocking. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's shocking how many of them are pretty accurate to how they feel after five or six or eight plays. And Revive is a great example because I love that game so much. After that play, I went out and bought it and I've played it a half dozen times now. And it pretty much everything I said on that show holds true with it. Yeah, we've gotten it wrong a couple times, but not that time. <laughs> nice. Well, Tim and I, we we both are recently back 
somewhat recently back from BGG Con 2023. And we only kind of bumped into each other there and got to briefly chat. So today we're going to discuss some highlights and just some of our favorite gaming experience we had when we were there. You know, one of my favorite things about BGG Con is that you're, you'll be in that like main ballroom area. And I just love looking around and seeing just seas and seas of people playing board games. It, you know, it just, it brings me so much joy. Like sometimes I'll be playing a game and I'm enjoying the game, but I just kind of pause and look around and I'm like, this is so fun seeing all these people enjoying board games in the same room, different games together. So I'm super curious to know like what your BGG Con experience was like. And I guess this was my third BGG Con. How many times have you been to BGG Con or any other like uh, BGG conventions like BGG Spring or the cruises or anything? Exactly once. This was my first large gaming ah. convention. Now I've been to some uh-huh. sm- small local ones like here in Phoenix, just, you know, but these are tiny little ones that are set in a little, you know, tiny local height or something. Um, so this was my first big one. I was really excited. I wanted to get, I do a, I do a, like a regular gaming getaway with my, my, you know, guest hosts on our show. And we do this twice a year where we go and rent an Airbnb and we just play games for five days. Nice. Straight. And so every time I thought about going to a big convention, I was like, well, I'd rather just, you know, I just want to be playing games with my friends anyway. So why, why don't we just keep doing it that way? But one of our listeners finally talked to me and this listener, Josh, he finally talked to me into coming to BGG Con. He's somebody that I play on Board Game Arena with. And he kept oh, saying cool. like, you got to come out to this show. It's so much fun. So I did. And I'm so, so glad I did. It was, it was That's a way awesome. better experience than I ever expected. And because of this one, I will definitely be back probably to BGG Con next year. But if not, then if nothing else, to some of the other big conventions around the country. Awesome. Awesome. I did not realize it was your first time, but that's that's super cool. And now I'm even you know more curious to talk to you about your experiences in general there. But um, I suspect a lot of listeners already know. But like for those who don't, BGG Con is an annual board game convention hosted by Board Game Geek at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in downtown Dallas, Texas. And um, Dallas is where technically BGG is headquartered because that is where our owner (laughs) lives, Scott Alden. We have like a warehouse there and everything. So we have two conventions there a year. There's BGG Spring that happens Memorial Day weekend and then BGG Con, which happens in November. And it's always after Spiel, because one of the hooks about it is we have a hot games room where we ship back a lot of the hottest games that just came out at Spiel. So you can come there, try them out and, you know, try before you buy if you want. So there's this whole hot games room. Then beyond that, we have a huge game library that has over 8,000 games, I think. Something, something crazy like that. So it's a it's a play convention. Yeah, this game library is unbelievable. Like it took up almost a whole ballroom. Just <laughs> the wall, the walls just lined with shelves, and it was such a cool process too to check it out because you'd, you'd walk in there. They had like an indoor and an outdoor. So you walk in the indoor, and you can just start looking around. And there, all the games are kind of alphabetically organized to some extent. Like at least you can find right. the A's together, etc. But it's like every time I would look at another shelf, there's like two more games that I want to play today, right now. But you would just yeah. you would just grab one off the shelf, and then as you're walking out the door, somebody's there to just scan your badge and scan the game, and you just get to borrow it. And if it's an older game, they were like eight hours. You can just bring it back within eight hours. And if it's a newer game, it was with, I think, within four hours or something like that. Yeah. Uh, So easy. And I got to play a bunch of favorite games, got introduced to a bunch of new games I always wanted to try just because they were sitting in in that library. It's super cool. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I love just like kind of wandering around in there. And I found out, like, because we have some stats, but I found out the top three games with the most checkouts uh, at this BGG Con was Last Light, Forest Shuffle, and Sky Team. So take that for what it's worth. But those were the games that a lot of people were checking out. I, I'd be curious to see like what's kind of like the oldest game that people checked out, or you know, because <laughs> I know there are some people that are like digging for like old gems. There's a lot. There, there, yeah. there are a lot of games there. Yeah, um, but if you have if you have analysis paralysis when playing games, then I would watch out walking to that room because you're going to have even more <laughs> AP trying to pick it. Up. 
Exactly. If you don't have something in mind, you're going to be in there just wandering around like, oh, cool. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's mostly a play convention. So people are taking games out of the library, playing them. There are like a lot of different open gaming areas. But there's also a small exhibit hall area with um, different publishers who come out who are demoing and selling games. There was a publishing company, I believe they were called Mosaic Games, that came all the way from India. Uh, And that was so exciting because they had never been to BGG Con. Maybe one or both of them, it was their first time in America, possibly. But it was just it was just cool to have people that come from all over the world come to the convention. I think we clocked in about like close to 3000 attendees. But I don't know how you feel about this, Tim, but like to me, I was always able to get a table. Like if I wanted to, you know, sit down and play somewhere, I I never felt like, oh, there's no space for me to play. But it does, especially on that Saturday, kind of get there are a lot of people there. (laughs) No, this was so awesome. So this is at that high Regency, as you mentioned, and this is a huge hotel in downtown Dallas. And I was shocked the minute I walked in the door. I expected there to be a couple ballrooms where people were really loaded into but it didn't matter where I walked in this hotel, there was people gaming. It could be at the cafe area, it could be in the front lobby, out by the bar. There was always games set up everywhere. But if you walked into one of those big ballrooms, there was always tables open. It didn't matter what time right. I went in there. We could always, if I if I was sitting down with some friends, we could always find a table to play at. So that was awesome. But beyond that, one of the other really cool things I liked about all the play spaces is that BGG had like they had signs around where you could just put it at your table that either said players wanted or teachers wanted. And so you could often you could just walk through the hall and just find games looking for players. So even if you didn't bring a game with you or you didn't have people to play with, there was places to sit down and play. And that was that was super cool. Yeah, I love that about game conventions that you you can, you know, even if you're like new to the scene and don't know anyone, it's usually a pretty welcoming environment. And like you said, you can just kind of like sit down and meet some new friends and sit down and play a game with people. Or there are a lot of people who are happy to teach, you know, so there's this the teacher needed or teacher wanted signs. So that's cool. It's just like an it's a it's an I find it to be a really nice vibe. Everybody's generally like happy and welcoming and just excited to be there playing board games with people and um, really, really nice energy. And uh, I guess besides that, there are also panels for people who aren't gaming 24-7, there are panels you can you can go check out. And um, each year we'll have special guests. So um, shout out to our special guests from this BGG Con. Our Family Plays Games did a panel. Um, they have a YouTube channel. And Grant Lyon is a comedian and a gamer. And uh, he did two sets of board game related comedy, which was cool. There's a nerdcore hip hop artist crossover 757, a bunch of game designers there, tons of game designers there, but a few of them were like special guests who did some panels and such like Alan Moon, Eric Lang, Martin Wallace was there, Matt Leacock, Dwight Sullivan, and Daryl Andrews. But there were even more designers there. Like I randomly bumped into the designer of Avalon. Um, And that was really cool to talk to him because my friends from the Game Ring podcast like play so much Avalon. (laughs) So it was cool to just like tell him the story of uh, how much Avalon those guys have played. And then like Shu and Christina, they have like a board game, uh, like a game show kind of thing that they do. And um, also the Puzzle Hunt Masters, Dave Arnott and uh, William Zamble were there. So... Yeah, big thanks to all the special guests, but like they just add a whole nother element to the show by having like different panels that people can go to if you're not someone like me who just wants to sit around and play board games all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I did just want to sit around and play board games, so I didn't make it any of the panels. But one of the cool things was that you could run into what I call board game celebrities everywhere here. I mean, people were just playing, whether it's designers, whether it was, you know, uh, reviewers, content creators, uh, you know, I got a chance... uh, So at one point, my favorite story is I'm just walking through the the big game ballroom. And I don't know if you know the game Arcs, but it's uh, it's being published by Leader Games. And so it hasn't been shipped yet, but I backed it a couple of years ago. We reviewed it on our show and I really loved it. So I've been watching the updates and I didn't think it had been backed, but I'm walking through 
the big ballroom and I see Ark set up on a table and it looks like a finished version of it, like all the <laughs> card art and everything. So I walked up to the group and I was like, did you guys get your copy already? And they, they kind of chuckled at me and said, no. Nah. And I looked down at the guy's name badge and it's Cole Worley, the designer of Arcs is sitting there playing <laughs> I love this. a kind I love of, not, not a finish, but a close to finish prototype of it. So, you know, I had those types of experience. I, at one point I got into an elevator with Martin Wallace and uh, didn't yeah. recognize him at first, but the games he's carrying, I was like, oh, okay, that's Martin Wallace. So it was, yeah. uh, it, it was really cool. And of course, got to run into you. I saw you were playing Nemesis with Steph, um, you know, oh, the, yeah. which, who I love yep. her blog. I didn't, it, like, it surprised me when, she, when I, I should have introduced myself to her, but it was just so cool to see so many people that I've read or watched or, or listened to or played their games just around and everyone was super friendly. I went up and chatted with everybody I could said, thank you. And you know, it, it was, it was a lot of fun. Also had a chance to run to like, shockingly people that listen to our show. There's a few of them out there and oh, they would awesome. wave me down and, you know, call me out and, and introduce themselves. I got a chance to play with some of them. So very cool place to go. If you want to meet people that you, you know, that are in this industry, that are in the board game industry and the hobby. That's, that's so cool. And I love your story about like bumping into Cole and Drew Worley. <laughs> Because, yeah, you're right. If you don't know what a designer looks like, you could be like the biggest fan of their totally. games and not know that you're like kind of walking right by them. That's, a, that's exactly right. Like I saw Eric Lang walking down a hallway. I know what Eric Lang looks like. He's got a very distinct look. But, uh, you know, I, like I don't know what Martin Wallace looks like or what Cole Worley looks like. So right, it, was, right. it was cool. And I, I ran into uh, John Gets Games. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you're familiar oh, with yeah, his yeah. YouTube Jonathan channel, Cox, but he does yep. this and he was playing around. So I had to introduce, I, like, he makes my life so easy because he teaches me so many heavy games. So it's so cool to, <laughs> you know, say hi to him. Yeah, so many great people I got a chance to meet. Everybody was really, really friendly. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you had a great experience overall for your first BGG Con. And we haven't even talked about your gaming highlights yet. So um, before we jump into our favorite gaming experiences from BGG Con 2023, I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately, Tim. So let's jump into fresh plays. All right. So the first game I wanted to talk about, now our show, we cover a lot of new games, but we also cover a lot of older games. And specifically, I am really excited about kind of making my way through like the Board Game Geek Top 100 list of all time. But, you know, basically, I'm going to talk about two games today, one of them that's brand new and one of them that's a bit older. So it's a good taste for what I normally talk about on our show. The first one I want to talk about is the expansion for Arc Nova. This is the new expansion called Marine Worlds. Yes. Uh, Candace, are you a fan of Arc Nova? I would say I'm sort of a fan. Like, I guess okay. I'm a fan, but it's I'm not like Gaga for Ark Nova. Like, I like it. I appreciate it. I'm happy to play it with any player count except four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not like someone who, like, went nuts for it. So, and it's funny because, like, actually, we're talking about BGG Con. My very first BGG Con Arc Nova was one of my two favorite games that I played there, and we learned it for the first time in the hot games room, and it was so exciting. But yeah, so I would say I'm a fan, but I'm not Gaga. Okay. Well, before I'm done talking, you'll know whether you should play this expansion. I'm assuming you haven't played the expansion yet, have you? I actually have. I actually okay, have. Okay, well, then you already know. You already know, but I'll, I'll share with your listeners anyway. Yes, thanks. So um, re the Marine Rolls expansion just came out, I think, uh, in the in the North America Capstone Games is the is the publisher, and they just sent out pre-orders. You may be able to find it in retail now, but I got mine a few weeks ago. This was designed by Matthias Wig, and it plays one to four players, as Candace mentioned already. So I'm not going to go into the details on how Arc Nova plays. Everybody's probably played it at this point. It's sitting at number four on the Board Game Geek top 100 list of all time, but it's about building a zoo. And this expansion, I think, does some really cool things by both adding a lot of variability to the game. I don't think it really needed a lot of variability because it already had a ton, but it adds a whole <laughs> bunch of new animal cards to your deck. But it adds things like new endgame scoring goals. It adds um, you know, some of the new conservation projects. It adds new bonus tokens to put on the conservation track. So if you play a lot of Arc Nova, just those things alone, you know, give you some value here. Now the the 
the animals that get out of the deck are kind of interesting though, because they went, as it's, as you can see, it's called marine worlds. So they went with aquarium based animals. These are underwater animals. And of course you need special enclosures for animals that are going to stay in aquariums. So there's a new type of basic enclosure you can build. Uh, and there's two sizes of them, but they're aquariums. They work a lot like the petting zoos uh, in the original one where you can build them on your, you know, on your unflipped building action, but uh, they take up, you know, their specific shape. And then when you build animals, they can, they can go in these. The difference is a lot of the animals in this expansion can only go in the aquariums. So it's not like you can choose to put them in the aquariums or in something else like you can with the large bird aviary. Um, now, the, the challenge with doing that with a game like this is that you're adding a whole bunch of new cards in a game where you're already kind of searching through the deck trying to find specific cards, specific animals to hit your goals or whatever, you know, hit conservation projects. So what they added to most of these cards as well as a little icon that anytime one of them comes out into the, you know, the, um, the row, the, the kind of the market of cards, then it pushes one off. So that's one thing they did to just try to make sure that those cards are rotating. You're getting a chance to see a lot of cards in there. Um, but they also added another type of, of marine animal, and they're these reef animals. So whenever you see this reef icon on one of these cards, it triggers a special ability. But if you play a second reef animal, it triggers your other reef abilities as well. So it's got this cool little, if you can get the right card combo going with them, it's got this cool little engine building mechanism that didn't really exist in the base game. Um Beyond that, they added, I think, I think to solve some people's complaint that it was hard to make a good hand or build what you want to, but they also added another uh, university type that essentially lets you, that adds a specific, you, you can kind of pick which animal, as long as you're the first one to pick it, you can pick which animal icon you automatically get added to your zoo. And at the same time, it searches the deck for the next animal of that type. So if you're really going for a predator, you're really going for uh, you know, an, an underwater animal, you can you can basically guarantee you're going to get one and get the icons you need to go with it. Now, personally, that was never a complaint for me. I always thought the puzzle of trying to work with what you've got and and you know identify what's of what's of value that was always exciting for me. So that that didn't bother me. But I've heard other people complain. I think they were trying to solve that there. Um, but here's where I think the expansion does the most, and that is that the the cool thing about Arc Nova is the action selection, where you've got these five cards. And then they're in a row and whenever you use one, you use it at the power that it's at and then you move it down and it gets weaker. And so everyone has the same basic five cards. Well, now they added some some basically special uh, cards that have special abilities that you draft at the start of the game. And everybody's going to end up with two of these after you've drafted them that are going to replace your basic action. So let's say that you upgrade, you're going to get a, an upgraded association action card or an upgraded building action card. And these are really fun. I've played a couple games with it now, and it really changes what you can do with your strategy, especially like the association card, which can be really tricky because if you only have one association worker, you get to use it once. And then that card is kind of just like blocking up your row until you do a reset. And so like the, the association card I drafted was really cool. It said, if it's at five power, you can actually use it to just get another association worker instead of using it on a conservation project. So then it's never wasted. But then when you flip it, instead of getting an association worker, it now lets you spend an association worker to get a two power you know, discount essentially on the action. So that's just one example. But, but it's really cool that it really changes up how every game you're going to have slightly different asymmetric capabilities yeah. from, from the other people around the table. And I thought that was the most fun part of it. The last thing that they added that's worth noting is that they added a bunch of upgraded components, primarily the conservation markers that everybody has on their player board. They used to be just little cubes. Well, they replaced those with animals. And I would say this is a little gimmicky, except I always play black and the black animals are penguins and they even have a white belly on them and they're yeah, adorable. Yeah, they're the coolest. <laughs> and I'm, I think I would have bought this expansion just for those penguins. Um, they also <laughs> replace like some of the markers you use on the board, the score track markers, you know, the appeal marker and stuff like that. Um, so I think, you know, like the expansion is, if you play it a lot, you should just get this expansion because not only are you going to get some upgraded components, you're going to get more variability in the, in the game. Um, but you're going to get these upgraded action cards. But my personal take on it is that if you don't play Arc Nova a lot, if you don't love Arc Nova, you don't really need this expansion. You know, it's it's not like it's going to change yeah. the game drastically or make you like it more. Um, and if you, if you play it so much, you may never even see some of these cards in the deck as you're going through. It's such a huge deck of cards. So, you know, I, my feel is that it's great for fans. Probably not going to fix the game for someone. Who, what do you think, Candice? Would, would you agree with that? 
Yeah, I I would totally agree with that. Um, I don't think it's I I think it's one of those expansions that I probably will just always include because it doesn't add too much to it. But I like all of the little changes. You know, I like having the slightly asymmetric set of action cards. I think that's fun. I think the like marine animals. You know, yeah. I didn't ever feel like in the couple of games that I played with the expansion, I didn't feel like I was really like leaning into that just because of the cards in my hand and the cards that were flowing. But I, I love how I love how that icon does make the the deck cycle through faster. Um, so that was a nice touch. Like everything was really nice. I like the upgrades. I would totally agree that like, yeah, if you're a fan of Arc Nova, this is a no brainer. But I don't think you need it or it's going to like necessarily fix the game if you didn't already enjoy the game. And yeah. to me, it's just it's just kind of smooth. Like I said, like once I mixed it in, I was like, oh, I don't think I ever need to take these out. Like it doesn't add that much complexity. You know, maybe if I was playing with someone for the first time, like just use the basic action cards or something. But I don't think mixing in the marine animals changes that much. Um, so I, I like it. I like it. And I think, yeah, if you're an Arc Nova fan, like you're going to really like it. It's just like a little yeah. more makes things a little more interesting, you know? And once you shuffle in those cards into that, you know, huge stack of cards, that really, you're never going to want to pull them out again. So I right. agree, you know, mainly <laughs> if you're going to do, if you're going <laughs> to teach it to a new player, maybe leave off the new university and don't mix in the new action cards, but otherwise it's not that big of a deal to teach them a right. new structure type and a couple icons. So anyway, that was Arc Nova Marine Worlds expansion. I was really excited about it. I think it's great. I think it, it wasn't as, uh, you know, game changing as I was, I guess, expecting or kind of hoping for. Right. It just felt like playing more Arc Nova, but it, but I like Arc Nova. So it was, it was good. Cool. Cool. That is Arc Nova Marine Worlds expansion. The first game I'm going to be talking about is something that I played at BGG Con, and it was not on my radar at all. Uh, but my friend Chuck, um, Chuck is a solo developer who works with like David Turtsy. I think he d designed the solo mode or developed the solo mode for like Septima Mind Clash game. Uh, but anyway, Chuck and I were like, we were like, we got to play a game together at BGG Con. And we ended up playing a couple, which was nice. Um, but one of the games that he had that he just received his Kickstarter copy of is a game called Raising Robots. And this is a 2023 release designed by Brett Sobel and Seth Van Orden. And they have a publishing company called Novu Games. And... You might know some of their other games, Stockpile, Crosstalk, or The Reckoners. Uh, I think I played Crosstalk at one point, but I haven't played the others. But Raising Robots is a one to six player game that's like a tableau engine building game, and it's mostly played simultaneously. So I would say off the bat, just seeing this game kind of set up and hearing a little bit about it, I'm thinking this is wingspan but with robots <laughs> instead of birds and it has it has some of that to it so each player is going to play as a famous inventor and you're going to be assembling a collection of robots like building robots into your tableau um you have each player has this like big player board and um again picture wingspan so a good chunk of the player board is three rows where you're going to be playing cards into your tableau but on the left side of your player board, you have different actions. And some of the actions have an area at the top that have these discs, which you can unlock things with an upgrade action. So the way the actions work is that each round, well, all players have this eight card deck of these energy cards. So each round at the, I guess you play this over, I forget how many rounds. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many rounds, but. You will shuffle your card of at your deck of energy cards at the beginning, and each round, all players will simultaneously draw from their energy deck and reveal two energy cards. Um, so the decks are um, symmetrical, so everybody has the same deck, but you just don't know the order in which these different energy cards are going to come out. And energy is basically like action points. So after everybody reveals what their two energy cards are. You're going to pick 
action cards. So everyone has the same set of, I think they're like five action cards. And you're going to secretly pick two of those and assign them face down to your energy cards. So everybody's doing this at the same time. So it's like simultaneous thinking there. And then uh, once everyone's done that, you flip your cards over. So, you know, maybe I have a two energy card action associated with the assemble action. Um, and my another energy card is like a three energy card and it's associated with the design action. So what happens is on these energy cards at the top, some of them have a little energy cube and the components in this game were really nice, but I just don't know like if they were upgraded for the Kickstarter edition or if the, this is just like what you get if you buy the game. I'm not sure on that because like I said, I'd never heard of this game before, but any cards of your energy cards that have these energy cubes, you are going to put on this like small central board that has all five actions. And let's say like the card that's above my assemble action had an energy cube. So on this central board, I'm going to put an energy cube on the uh, assemble action. That means that everyone is going to get to do the assemble action, whether they played that card or not, but they'll just have one energy point. Of course, if they also played an assemble card and had like three energy points on the card they played it with, they'll add those energy points. But the cool thing with the way you play these energy cards is sometimes it's going to allow you to do more than those two actions that you're playing cards of. And then you also like one of the resources in the game is batteries. So if you have batteries, you can always kind of like boost your actions. But then after everyone simultaneously reveals, then you simultaneously perform your actions. And there's a flow that's easy to see on your player board of the order in which you do actions. I think it was like, Upgrade, then assemble, then design, then fabricate, recycle. Now, granted, you're only doing at least two things for the cards you did, but you might have bonus actions, but you have to do all these actions in order. So you just kind of like follow your player board around, do one thing at a time. You can choose to spend more energy to kind of like enhance the action. But the things you're doing with your action points, you can upgrade, like I said, unlock discs off of your player board to reveal some kind of juicy thing when you take that action in the in the future. You're also then taking that disc and putting it either on a robot in your tableau or on like a scoring objective card and you're boosting that card. So you're like upgrading gives you like two bonuses essentially. Then there's an assemble action where you're able to play robots into your tableau. And if I recall, you spend resources to play robots. Um, but there's a whole thing with the energy cost of the robot that you're playing. Um, you know, if you spend a lot of energy, maybe you can play two robots if you have the resources. Resources, I felt, were very tight in this game and <laughs> hard to get. So you're also trying to, like, build up an engine that you so you have some resource income. Then there are these three actions called design, fabricate, and recycle. And when you take, let's say, the design action... Most of these are just going to give you like some kind of resources or other effects like more cards or something like that. But when you take the design action, you're going to trigger every card in your design tableau. Like that's the top tableau. The second one is associated with the fabricate action. The third one is associated with recycle. So you're getting something from the action, but then you're also getting to trigger wingspan style all of the cards in that row, except you're doing it in the left to right direction, not the right to left. So there's a cool thing as you build up cards and then they're like a lot of the robot cards, they have the most adorable art on them. And like all of the thematic touches in this game were really, really nice. But, you know, certain robot cards do generate other things if they're next to certain types of robot or if they're different, you know, such and such robots above it or below it. Like, so there are all these like synergies where you can kind of add these robots into your tableau. But I love that like it played so fast because like once we knew what we were doing, the the simultaneous like perform run your board kind of thing is really cool. I like the 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 whole idea of, hey, we don't have a choice in what energy cards that are going to be played in front of us, but we choose what actions we're associating with them. And that may impact other players and other players might be like, oh, Tim, like, I really hope, you know, I see you have an energy card that puts a cube up. I really hope it's going to be for recycling because I'm not playing my recycling card, but I really want to do a recycling action also. So there's like some of that fun of like predicting 
and hoping what other players might, which actions they're associating with their energy cards. But again, you're like, you're running your actions and your tableau, all of that at the same time. So it really makes for a, a snappy game experience. Again, like the art and the humor, the different inventors that you play, like there's a like a little like kid like version of Albert Einstein and stuff like they have all these and they have like little special powers, which you can kind of upgrade as well. The resources are like sensors, gears, microchips, programs. And then there's duct tape, which is a wild resource, which is like, you know, duct tape fixes everything, right? <laughs> so I thought like this was like a really, really solid game. And I didn't really know anything about it going into it. And I'd never heard of it. And I was really like pleasantly surprised. And I think people who like are looking for kind of a game in the the wingspan space of like tableau engine building but for a different like kind of take on it and not nature theme you know if you're like these robots are so cute like one of them had an etch a sketch head one of them was like a giraffe that had a drum like really really cool um but yeah i i was i was really like pleasantly surprised by it and uh that's raising robots have you ever heard of that one or played I, it, I, it- I had not heard of it at all. And I just was looking at some of the art. The art's adorable, as you mentioned. And I can see why, you know, you're kind of linking it back to Wingspan. It definitely has that. It looks like it has that type of feel to it, especially the way you activate your tableau or row of your tableau seems pretty similar. I'm curious, though, because when you got some that's simultaneous action, it can be nice because it does make things move quickly. But what I find in a lot of games like that is you don't really care what anyone else is doing around the table. So I know there was a little bit of that, like when you reveal what action you're going to take, you're going to try to guess what other people are doing. But how much do you feel like if somebody was like, I I like euros, but I like some interaction. Do you feel like there's much here? Or is it pretty much you're kind of playing your own game and could ignore what everyone else is doing? If I recall, I think the main interaction is from the action selection, you know, that that reveal and seeing what other people play because that's going to maybe allow you to get more actions. But I don't think I necessarily was like paying attention too much to what other people were doing. And I'm trying to remember if any of the cards kind of were like based on what your opponents are doing. I I don't remember, but definitely not something that's super interactive. Yeah, fair enough, say. fair enough. Anyway, it sounds fun. Did, did Was your yeah. friend, so your friend got this from Kickstarter. I always like to ask the question. Somebody backed something on Kickstarter probably several years ago, been waiting all this time. Did he like it? Was he happy that he got he, it? He liked it. Everybody had it. Everybody enjoyed it quite a bit, actually. And I think I, we almost played it a second time at some point, <laughs> but then we pivoted to Evenfall because I told them I would teach them Evenfall, which I was excited to play that again. Uh, a rare side ki- note. Rare, a rare Kickstarter success. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So I think he was pretty happy with it. I think his friends that we played with, they they all enjoyed it. And again, it's just like, it's so snappy. It's so snappy. And sometimes games with the simultaneous action selection, like stuff like Earth, I didn't really enjoy Earth too much. From I only played it once, but I found that I would go to like kind of run my tableau and I'd be done and I'd just be waiting around. But I didn't feel that with this game. And I don't think I noticed anyone else like kind of sitting around like a lot of, again, the deciding which action cards to play. You're simultaneously like thinking and then, you know, I, di- I didn't find that problem. But but yeah, it's it's snappy. <laughs> nice. So that is uh, Raising Robots. What else have you been playing lately? Well, my second game I, I got played this week is a game I've been wanting to play for a long time. And this is one of the few games left on the Board Game Geek Top 100 that I hadn't played yet. And this is Grand Austria Hotel. This was designed by Virginia nice. Gigli and Simone Luciani. And uh, it was it was released in 2015. So it's a little bit older one published by Lookout Games in North America. And it plays two to four players. Candice, have you, I assume you've played Grand Austria Hotel, right? I played Grand Austria Hotel. I don't even know if it was just once or twice. But I liked it. Okay. I liked it a lot. Yeah, what surprised me it. about it, <laughs> no, I, I really like these designers. Uh, you know, there's a group of Italian designers that tend to rotate who they partner with, but they always tend to co-design games together. And yeah. uh, Virginia Gigli and Simone Liciani specifically had worked on Lorenzo Il Magnifico, which is one of my favorite of their designs. 
And we did a double header that night. So me and a couple of friends played the two of these games back to back, which was great. Awesome. It was really fun to revisit Lorenzo right before going into Grand Austria. Uh, what struck me with Grand Austria Hotel is that one, it is, um, it's, it's about the same weight as Lorenzo. It's not very heavy. It's pretty easy to teach, pretty easy to start playing. So that was, I like that. I like a nice mid-weight game that you can really get into. It's easy to remember the rules. But it's basically a, um, it's, it's kind of an order fulfillment game. Really what you're trying to do is collect, you've got a few visitors. The theme of the game, of course, is that you are running a hotel and you're trying to, uh, basically feed guests at your hotel and then get them into rooms that they're they're happy they're going to spend the night. So there's a small chain of events you do here. But the key of it is that you're, it's a dice drafting game where there's a group of dice that are that are uh, rolled. You know, everybody's going to be drafting from them. And the what's kind of unique about it is when you when you draft a dice, it, the power of that action is going to be based on the number of dice of that number. So there's six numbers, of course. Let's say that you rolled these eight dice and three of them are ones. That means you get to take that action essentially three times or three power worth of that action. And so they're going to be things like collecting resource, you know, one of the four types of resource cubes or playing these, uh, these helper cards out of your hand or a couple other things. And, um, and so that was, uh, that was fun. I always like, I like dice drafting, but I don't usually like order fulfillment. It, you know, it can be a little dull, collect some resources, turn them in for something else. He, he, this is one of the rare exceptions where it worked pretty well for me. One, because the economy of those resources was tight. It was really tricky and challenging working with that dice draft to try to get what you needed. But two, because all of the visitors, when you fulfilled them, they generally gave you some pretty important benefits that you needed to kind of run your engine. Most specifically, there's this track on the board called the Emperor track that, uh, you know, kind of a Luciani trademark is that you have to in this case, it's not feeding your people, but you have to meet some requirement every round. Yeah. <laughs> and this one was particularly exciting because there was kind of a threshold. Every time you moved up the Semper track, at the end of the round, it would assess how far you up, were up there. And you lose, in the first round, you lose three spaces on the track. And if, you're, if, you're, if your marker ends above a certain threshold, you get a pretty good benefit for it. But if it ends below a certain threshold, you're going to get a pretty big negative for it. So it's very tight. Both, you know, there's, but there's positive and negative with that, which was cool. In any case, one of the main ways you're moving up that track is by fulfilling these orders. So it was just this chain of events that would happen. And then once you fed the visitor, you'd send them into an open room. So prior to, to fulfilling that order, you had to have opened the right color room that they could go into. And then there was some bonus that would be triggered if you opened and filled the right set of rooms. Uh, so for what was a fairly straightforward rule set, there was a lot of interesting little interactions that I enjoy in games. And I thought this worked really well. My only real complaint with it, and a thing that I think is going to make it hard for me to bring back to the table, is the way you do this dice draft to snake draft. So first player is going to take the first dice, second player is going to take the second dice, third is going to take the third and the fourth dice, and then go back down to the second player, et cetera. We played a three-player game. And that means a lot of downtime in between your turn because the first player has to wait essentially four turns before it gets back to them in a three-player game. In a four-player game, that means you're waiting six turns before it gets back to you. And for what were pretty simple light actions, it took a long time for you to sit there. Like, you know what you want to do. You got to watch those dice slowly disappear before they get back to you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And you're just sitting there. And then, you uh, you know, when it gets back to you, yeah. you got to make your decision based on the dice that are left. So I think the biggest flaw with the game is the way that was structured and the downtime that's going to come out of it. Other than that, it was really fun. Um, I did get a chance to play this two player after that three player game and that worked better. And I think didn't really, you didn't lose a lot um, because you roll a few less dice. And so there's just as much restriction in it. So I think at a, as a two player game, this is a solid, you know, mid weight dice drafter. I think at a three or four player game, uh, it's, I'd probably rather be playing something with less downtime. Yeah. So I think I've only played this with two players and I can't remember okay. if I've only played it once or if I played it twice, but I remember hearing about, like exactly what you're talking about. And that's why I was like, okay, well, I'm going to play this at two player, yeah. you know? And you, you, typically I don't like to just go by like what I hear, but sure. that is the way I kind of delved into that one. So it was interesting to hear that you had that, that problem with the downtime. Cause that, eh, that doesn't, that doesn't sound great, but I do love like the theme of this game. And I, I just remember enjoying it quite a bit. I think I just wasn't playing it. So I ended up like selling my copy of it. But I, I also hear like really good things about the expansion. Let's Waltz, I think it's called. 
Yeah. Um, so I would be curious to try some of the modules from that. I know people who have that and I'm at a point where I'm like, I don't need to own every game. <laughs> if my right. friends have it. I'll play it with them. And uh, so, so this is one that I'll definitely like revisit at some point. And I really appreciate and enjoyed and I never, you know, played it with three or four to kind of experience that downtime, but I'm not a big fan of downtime like that. Yeah, it's funny. Sometimes people complain about downtime in the game. I'd heard similar complaints, but I didn't know why they were complaining about downtime. And I don't mind a little downtime between turns if it's just a thinky game and it just takes that long to get around to the, the t- you know, around the table. But in this case, it's specifically because you have to wait for so many other turns before you, which makes it particularly... Yeah frustrating or annoying. So I think in this case, it is warranted to pay attention to that. I still had fun with it at three players. Um, I think four players would really start to drag though. So unless you've got people around the table, don't mind chatting and, you know, having a conversation before it comes back to your turn again. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it sounds like I get like with your downtime situation in that three player game, it sounds like part of the problem is like, it's not like during your downtime, you could be planning because you don't know which die is going to be available to take at that point. So that well, that seems like it makes it a little extra rough. Yeah, beyond that, the decisions just aren't even that complicated. So it's not even yeah. like, you know, it's not like you have a lot to plan for. It's not like I have to think about, okay, what am I going to do three turns from now? That's it's good. pretty yeah. simple choices. So when it gets back to you, it's not a lot to figure out, but it's like you haven't had a lot to, you know, like... I think when there's downtime, like if a game has a lot of downtime, if it's keeping my brain busy while the other people are taking their turns, that's all. That's fine. I don't mind that. But this one, I don't think there's just enough meat there to really keep you thinking and planning, even if you could plan around it. So again, yeah, gotcha, a gotcha. really, yeah, really fun game. Uh, Grand Austria Hotel. You know, I'd recommend it if you like a nice midweight Euro style game. But I'd recommend playing it at two, three players max. Cool, cool. So I don't know what it is with me and Tableau Builders today, but (laughs) the next game I'm going to tell you about that I just played recently is called Forest Shuffle. And at BGG Con, um, Eric brought me a couple of games that he received two review copies of, and one was Forest Shuffle. So this is a review copy that I received via Eric from, I guess, Lookout Games. And it's a 2023 release uh, designed by Kosh, who also designed Fife from 2022, which I I played. I forget where. Maybe that was at BGGCon last year, actually. Um, but that is the other game that I saw designed by Kosh. Um, this is a two to five player game, which is a forest tableau building game. And you're trying to get the most points from cards in your tableau. So you're going to be playing trees and putting different animals and plants around these trees and you're trying to like synergize your tableau to score as many points as possible so you have this big deck you know this this game is all about the cards you have this big deck of cards that are trees and forest dwellers which are like different types of animals plants mushrooms and you also have these three Winter is Coming cards, uh, not Game of Thrones, but <laughs> they do it's say the Winter wolf. is Coming, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you set up the game, you'll take out a certain amount of cards depending on your player count. Like in a two-player game, I think you, you remove like 30 cards, I believe. And because it's a, it's a big deck of cards. And then you divide the deck into three roughly equal stacks and you shuffle two of these winter cards into uh, one stack and then you put the third winter card on the top of that stack and then the other two stacks just go right on top so they don't have any winter cards in them but that's the timer for the game so as you're playing the game and you're drawing cards uh, from the deck when the third winter card pops out the game ends immediately so the cards i mentioned you have tree cards and then you have these forest dwellers the tree cards are just, they'll have a tree on them, kind of like if, like really nice art, by the way. Um, it reminded me of Arboretum a little bit. So you'll have a card with a tree and maybe there's like an effect at the bottom and, you know, maybe some points or how it scores. But the other cards, the forest dwellers, they are all split either vertically or horizontally. So there's kind of a multi-use card play effect that you have different options and different ways that you can play them. So once a tree is played into your tableau, you can tuck a card on the left side, you can tuck a card on the right side, tuck one on the bottom, tuck one on the top. 
there are certain cards that can have multiple cards tucked on the same side, you know, if that's kind of how that card effect works or how it scores or whatever. But on your turn, super simple. You either draw two cards or play a card into your tableau. When you draw cards, you're either just drawing them from the deck or as you discard cards in this game, you put them face up into an area known as the clearing. And um, you can also, when you're drawing cards, take cards from that face up pool of cards. Um, and then when you play cards, you're going to pay the cost of the card. And again, if it's if it's a card that's split in two, you'd pay the cost that's associated with whatever side you're actually playing. The card costs are always discarding um, a number of cards. I think it's between zero and two. I don't know if I saw in my uh, first play of this game, I don't know if I saw anything that costs more than that, but maybe there were some that were three. But anyway, when you pay for a card, you put cards from your hand into the clearing area. And so you're thinking about like, oh, well, I see... um, Tim is collecting butterflies, so I don't want to discard butterflies so he can just pick it up. And, uh, you know, there's there's some play, player interaction there with that. But the cards, the cards sometimes have an immediate effect. Um, they'll some of them have a bonus opportunity, possibly in addition to the immediate effect. And the way the bonus works is each card has a different type of tree it's associated with, and there are eight different types of trees in this game. So there's a little icon. And if I play a card, let's say a deer that has an oak tree icon, if I pay for it with cards that also have oak tree icons, I and it has a bonus effect, I get to trigger the bonus effect. So there's like there's sometimes where in order to trigger these bonuses, you want to discard certain cards that match the card that you're playing. But otherwise, the cards, some of them have like effects during the game. Some of them have like set collection scoring. Like I mentioned butterflies. I went butterfly strategy a little bit uh, because if you get all five types of butterflies, it's like 20 points at the end of the game. Um, some of them have like combo scoring. Like, hey, if if I have this animal, it says I get 10 points if I have a bat on the other side of this tree. Some of them are synergizing like, oh, if I have X, Y, Z in my forest, like somewhere in my tableau, I will get points. So it's it's stuff like that, you know, nothing, nothing too groundbreaking or new. But the card art, as I said, is beautiful. And also the other thing that's cool about this game is I mentioned you discard cards when you're paying for cards to this clearing area. They actually include a board, which... You don't really need the board. Like you could just play this game with the deck of cards and say, okay, you know, discard these cards over here. But the cool thing is the board, the art like looks like a forest and it's really cool. So it actually kind of enhances the experience and the table presence as you're playing cards and building out your tableau. So I I really liked having that board there, even though it was like something um, that wasn't necessarily, you know, needed. I like that the game ends immediately when the third winter card kind of gets drawn because it created this like tension as we're playing. And, you know, after you see the first winter card, you're like, okay, whatever, keep playing, keep playing. Then the second one comes and it's like, oh, crap, I got to do so much before that other one comes. And every time you need to draw from the deck or your opponent draws from the deck, like you're just like, oh, is it going to end? Is it going to end? So I like that tension. It reminded me of um, the dragon cards in Ethnos. Uh, if yeah. you've ever played uh, I was that, gonna, I was saying the same thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. This one, when when you when you kind of distributed those three cards in the deck, were they just completely random, or did you kind of like shuffle one into the bottom third of the deck, etc.? I didn't remember if you said that. Oh yeah, so yeah, so you divide the whole deck into three stacks, okay. and then it. just one of the stacks, you shuffle two of them in, and Ooh, then okay. you put the you put the third one at the top of that same deck. So all three are associated with like the bottom third of cards and then the other two stacks just go on. So you don't know when, you know, what the last one could be at the very bottom of the deck. It could happen like really quickly. You don't know. And I, I like that kind of uh, excitement and sort of like randomness. So the same thing is in soul. I don't know if you've ever played soul, but like soul has a thing where like, you know, when the eighth, 
one of these cards comes out, that's it, game over. Yeah, the solar so, flare cards or whatever they are ex- there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah, you brought up Arc Nova, and I, I kind of got like some kind of like Arc Nova light feelings from this because it's like you're building those cards into your tableau and synergizing, and of course you're like building a zoo and other things in that game because it's a lot heavier. But this is just, it was very pleasant, and my partner Matt, who's not like a big gamer, um, really enjoyed it, got into it. I love that it's it's simple and your tableau, it, it, this takes up a lot of space, by the way. <laughs> like as you start building out, like I had 11 trees and not all of them had cards around them, but it, it I can't even imagine playing this game with five players. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at pictures of it right now and it's crazy because one person can have five, seven, eight, ten trees in front of them and then all these yeah. cards... And it looks really cool. Like it, it has this really cool effect where you've got this big tree and then animals kind of poking their heads out from behind it yeah, or flying yeah. above it. So it, it looks pretty neat on the table. I am glad that they included that board for the middle for the the discards or, or whatever, because there's something about just like a bunch of random stuff all over a table that really bugs me. So when there's there's got to be something to center, you know, like center. everything. Yeah, so I'm, glad, yeah. I'm glad they put that there. Me too. And like I said, it like the 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 art on it, just like ties everything together and i mean in our two-player game we had like different strategies but somehow we ended up tying which was just it was it was wild but yeah there are a lot of different cards like different ways you can combo them i like that again they're they're multi-use cards so you have like a lot of different options it's cool i i really i really enjoyed it for like a light kind of tableau building game you know, again, more more nature games, but it's 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 nice, and I think it's going to be like very accessible for people. Again, I don't know that I would play it with five players, uh, yeah. but I think like two or three uh, would be nice, and maybe maybe four, maybe four. <laughs> when you say it's light, now it it lo- sounds like the actions you're taking are pretty simple. You know what you do on your turn, simple, but there's a lot of iconography. It looks like on these cards. Is it easy to distinguish that iconography? Like, could you? Is this a family weight game, or is this something that's going to require a little bit more thinkiness and comprehension? You know, it's funny because like Matt was saying after we played, he's like, "Oh, I think my dad would like this because of the art, and he likes going on like nature walks and everything." But I think it might be like family plus because, yeah, there okay. are. But but I don't know. I, I think it's like I, I would say it's it's about wingspan lightness. Gotcha. You know, yeah. or yeah. if you can, I don't know, whatever lightness you consider wingspan to be, I would say it's that, you know, like well, the, the icons. There aren't that many icons. And once you know how it works, it's like there's a draw cards icon. There's a take another action icon. Some of the cards have text and it's it's pretty straightforward. Like, oh, if you have another if you have a bear card here under this tree, also you get 10 points, you know, so there's a there's been all you mentioned wingspan and you mentioned Earth and there's been a like just a spate of nature themed games uh, over the last few years. I think wingspan really, you know, obviously brought it to the surface. How does this fit for you? Do you think this is going to be a memorable game in that genre or is it going to kind of fade with all the other, um, you know, all the other nature games that that have been coming out? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think I would say it just kind of depends. Like, I think Matt liked it a lot and I think I liked it and I think you know, some of those synergies you're looking for with your cards, again, in something like Arc Nova, I probably enjoy it more in this. And, oh, there, there's one other thing I didn't mention. When the clearing, at the end of your turn, you have to check to see if the clearing has 10 or more cards. And then the clearing wipes completely. So that was really interesting multiple times in the game because there are some cards that are like, hey, do something with all the cards in the clearing. Like everybody has this cave card where you can tuck cards under and it's almost like the eggs on your cards in Wingspan. But there's like timing things when this when this clearing is filling up. It's like, oh, is it going to pop? You know, or, oh, can I, oh, I really want that tree. Oh, I hope he doesn't, you know, discard two cards there because that's going to clear it and I won't be able to get that one card that I'm looking for. So I like that about it too. 
But I would say for me, I don't know. I don't know that like any of these games are in my real sweet spot. I like that this is small box. It's a small box. I like the, the card art and how the cards are played around the trees. And like some of the timing elements I really liked. I didn't get into Earth. So, but like to me, like Wingspan is always kind of special because, you know, it was one of the first games that kind of brought that tableau building nature with a nature theme. And so I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. Like, I just don't think these kind of games are ultimately my jam all that sure. much. But I think I'll hang on to this because I think it will be appealing to a lot of different gamers that I play with that aren't heavy gamers. And I enjoyed it quite a bit. Nice. Yeah, it looks it looks great. It looks really cool. Yeah. It looks like, you know, at least from a layout perspective, it looks unique uh, the way you're kind of sorting those cards. In. And it sounds really fun. So this is definitely one I'd like to try. Cool. And that is Forest Shuffle. And now a word from our sponsor. Business is booming in Greystone Gulch. Unexpected Games is thrilled to announce the Double or Nothing expansion for 3,000 Scoundrels. The hidden potential of the Traveler's technology has been unlocked with unique powers that add even more thrills to scouting and stealing technology. Furthermore, this tech can be modified with clear cards to make hundreds of combinations, making the West even wilder. Double or Nothing lives up to its name with new job and trait cards that literally double the number of scoundrel combinations to 6,000. Debts offer a quick infusion of cash to hire scoundrels earlier and get your engine rolling quicker, but there may be consequences if you fail to pay them off. With new scoundrel types, leader powers, a robust solo mode, and more, Double or Nothing delivers exciting new mechanics that add depth, strategy, and drama to enhance your games of 3,000 scoundrels. Order Double or Nothing now through the Asmodee shop or look for it on friendly local game store shelves. Let's jump into our highlights from BGGCon. So, Tim, I kind of made a list and some of them are groups of games and some of them are like one particular game. So I'll let you kick it off. All right. Sounds good. Well, I I could talk about so many games. I think I played 18 unique games at BoardGameGeekCon. So, you know, there's a ton to talk about and we can't go into all of them. So I thought I'd highlight just a couple of categories, a couple of things that created extra fun for me and in, in some cases in ways that I didn't expect to. So my first, uh, my, my first category I wanted to mention were obviously one of the fun things about going to a convention is that you might get to play new games and especially the hot new games. You mentioned the hot games room. That was so cool to walk in that game. I think there's like 34 tables set up with these, these games permanently set there and they're all the newest games. And I got a chance to sit and play a few of those. That was a blast. I played Evacuation in there. I played some games that I'd already reviewed like Age of Innovation, which I loved playing there. But um but yeah, so, you know, got to play a number of new games. Uh, also mentioned, you know, I played Kuna Horror. I played Arboretum for the first time, which isn't a new game, but it was still new to me. Speaking game of I- trees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Speaking of trees and and not wanting to discard cards that your opponents want. Oh, yeah. Um, hopefully for a shuffle isn't quite as mean as Arboretum, but uh, yeah. No, no, <laughs> so, it's so not as mean as Arboretum, but, but just as pretty. <laughs> yeah. But there was one game that I had never heard of that a friend introduced me to. So a new one to me, and this is Federation. This was a game that came out in 2022, designed by Dimitri Perry and Matau Verdier, and it was published by Eagle Griffin in the in North America. Um, I never know for sure in some cases where games are originally published. They always seem like they've got 15 publishers listed. So right. I'll just mention the North American <laughs> publisher. Uh, the player counts two to four on this. This is a pretty cool game. Have you have you seen this, Candace? Do you know what Federation looks like or have you played it? Yeah, I actually, uh, okay. I have, I've played Federation and um so the original publisher I know just because I got a demo of it I guess last year at Essen it's uh, Explore 8 they're a French publisher. Okay, got it. Um so they they were the original publisher but yeah, I I have played Ar- uh, Arboretum uh, Federation a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Basically everybody has four, we call them workers, but in this case they're little poker chips. And the reason why they use poker chips is cuz they have different values written on both sides. So you can either use when, when when you do a worker placement action here, you're either going to place the side up that has a number on it, or you can flip it over and place a side up that just has a little icon on it. 
Um, but the worker placement spaces are in the central board. And then all around the central board are these five different regions that you're going to be interacting with. They're represented by planets in this. So the idea, I think, is you're basically creating federations and, you know, the galactic federations out in space, some generic sci-fi theme. But right. <laughs> when you take one of these worker placement spaces, you don't only get the benefit that's listed on it, but there's a little bit of like an area control or area majority uh, thing that happens so that if you put a number uh, you know, face up when you take that space at the end of the round, you're going to look at that row. And if more of your, if you've got a higher total number in that row than anyone else, you get some bonus points. But then there's also this thing where the the worker placement spaces are set into t- kind of set into two different regions, nine spaces each. And each of those is going to trigger the basically scoring on a different planet of those five planets at the end of the round. And so um, you're kind of also putting more power in one or the other if you want that planet to score. Because every time you take an action at one of these planets, you increase your power with that planet. And the planets do a number of things. They might give you resources. They might give you a little tableau building where you you basically recruiting aliens and they're going to give you some ongoing effects. So each of these does something a little different. And every time you take one of those actions, your power goes up. So you want to trigger the scoring for the one you've got the most power in. And so there's a couple things that, you know, kind of interesting decisions that you're making as you're taking work replacement spaces. And uh, yeah, this was a pretty fun game. I think it, it looks really cool. It's got some, you know, really colorful, bright components, bright artwork on it. You know, a pretty simple resource management. There's four crystal types of different levels that you're going to spe- be spending to do some of these things. And you've got your own personal tableau board where you can essentially... Um, what they call it going on missions, but there's a a certain type of action you can do where you're going to basically mark some actions on your board that allow you to send ships up there and then complete them and get ongoing benefits for it. So a little bit of, um, uh, you know, juxtaposition between the central worker placement that you're interacting with and your own private kind of tableau you're building up and goals you're working towards. And uh, I thought it worked pretty well. Um, You know, it's, it's unique for worker placement in that you're not just fighting for the spaces, but I think, that was cool about it. I think the challenge with it is that they, they there wasn't enough tension in the actual work or spaces you're taking. In other words, they they made the tension into kind of fighting for the area control more than anything else. But if you wanted to go to a specific planet, for example, there was basically four ways you could do that in the main worker placement spaces. And, and that was pretty true. So there, it never really felt like you were blocked out, at least not with your first couple of workers, to do any particular thing. Now, there was a little bit of a race element at each of these planets as well, where the first person to get to a certain point would get this uh, badge and you were trying to get a you know set of all the badges in the, I think they're called badges or trophies. But, you know, again, lots of fun interaction. It went pretty quickly, you know, fairly medium weight. Um, I enjoyed it, but I think when I play worker placement, I really like that tension of like, this is important. I have to take the space now because if I don't, my, ru- my my round is completely ruined. And Federation didn't really give that to me. So it was fun enough, but I think it will ultimately be a little bit forgettable for me. What did you think of it, Candace? So I enjoyed it quite a bit, mainly just, just because of what you were just talking about. Number one, all of those planets, I felt like you are racing everybody to try to get to the best spot on them to try to get have more influence than them. I liked the cho- I like games that are worker placement where you have different types of workers, so to speak. Yeah. And this one where you have the option of which way do you want to, um, which side do you want to play your chip? Which chip do you want to play where? Yeah, I would agree with you that you know there are multiple ways to take a particular action, but. I liked the decision space of which side do I want to be on? And I found that like at the table, we would be talking and like having like almost like it's a real political thing about like, (laughs) hey, I think we need to really push this scoring objective for this round. So, you know, join me on this side. And then also the other decision with where you're placing your workers in the, the, the Senate area, the up and down, like the vertical alignment of like I, I forget what it was but there were some benefits yeah. to being like having the majority going up and down versus left or right or being on the right side or left side if i recall yeah you could flip the tokens over and instead of using the numbered side you could use the back side of the thing which would then instead increase uh basically these tracks up at the top of that column you played in which would potentially trigger an end game scoring benefit. So you're right. right. And that was pretty cool too, because you might be really heavy in one area and you want that scoring benefit to trigger. So you're then kind of foregoing the 
instant points, or maybe you think like, hey, I don't need to put numbers in here. It's already where I need it to be. So I'm going to flip this over and just trigger that, you know, try to push that end game scoring. Um, I yeah. had forgotten though, you're right. There was some of that table talk where people were literally like, hey, you don't want him to get that full row. He's got six power there. You better jump in there with that piece. <laughs> and that is always fun. So you're, you're right. That was, yeah. a, that was a fun part of it. Yeah. And I, I like area majority scoring like that um, anyway. But I, I think, again, I really liked the feeling like I was racing for everything and wanting to be ahead of everyone on every planet. But you couldn't do that. And there was like those yeah. treats of when you get to like a juicy spot before someone, you just like, you can't do it all. Um, so I kind of like the, the little mix of the like space politics with that, like racing on these planet tracks. But that being said, like I haven't played it in a while, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I still have it and it's on my shelf and it's something that I did enjoy like quite a bit, but, um, you know, I haven't revisited it yet. So did you only play it one time or did you play it multiple times? I can't remember if I played it once or twice or three times. I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't logging <laughs> plays back then. The, but the um, but yeah, I, I played it. I think I played it just before Eagle Griffin had announced that they were going to uh, be publishing it in North America. So, yeah, I think this um, was a Kickstarter uh, as well when it first came out. So I don't, I don't know if I played like a, I think I might have played a Kickstarter deluxe edition too. So not sure how much that changed, but it was a really cool production regardless. Right, right, cool. So uh, that's Federation, and kind of a highlight of some of the new games that you got to play. I'm so glad you got to play Arboretum. What did you think of Arboretum? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought it I was very confusing to me at first. Um, yes. if I, you know, someone taught it to me pretty late at night and uh, the, the, yeah, the way you follow the paths and how to score them is so weird, is strange. Um, and then it's very mean, uh, which I found out <laughs> heavily at the end of the game where I thought I was all set up for some good scoring and nope, somebody yeah. said, nope, I'll just reveal a card in my hand and you don't get any of it. So uh, I, I think pretty good. Um, I like that type of kind of light card game that does interesting stuff. So I'd like to revisit it. I thought it was pretty fun. Yeah. I remember the same confusion when I initially learned it. Cause it's like, it's so simple. It's like, you can play a card anywhere, but then remembering to score, you need to have the most of those cards, like the highest value of that type of tree in your hand. Yeah. And yeah. And I love that. That's like, one of the best examples of you don't want to ever discard anything in that game. That's right. Because people can pick it up and it's, ah. Oh. Except <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I love started, Arboretum. I started to realize at the end of the game, you could discard a juicy card for someone to make them think they're going to get points, but you're holding the five and the six in your hand, in your hand of the same one so that they can never <laughs> yeah. beat you in the max <laughs> points. So, you, you know, you make them waste their turns on it. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to be really – you know, really aggressive in this game and yes, maybe, maybe yes. ruin some friendships. <laughs> yeah. For such a like pretty looking game with those nice cheese. Yeah. <laughs> it can be very, very mean. Uh, that's cool. That's cool. So I totally agree with you. Like playing new games at conventions is always a highlight for me. In the case of this recent BGG kind, I feel like I played a lot of prototypes and some unreleased games and a lot of them were like very, very promising. So we talked about Martin Wallace was there, came out from Australia. So it was cool. Like I, I had met Martin Wallace at the past two times that I've gone to Essen. And we've, you know, briefly just bumped into each other in the hallway. This is another designer where when I initially met him, I had no idea what he looked like. And it was like, oh, holy crap, that's Martin Wallace, you know. But Martin had a bunch of prototypes with him and I got to play I think maybe all of them or most of them but I'll just talk about a couple of them briefly Steam Power is a new game and it's going to be published by uh his publishing company Wallace Designs and it's something that's I think targeted for 2025 it's going to be on crowdfunding maybe GameFound in January I think 2024 um sometime in early 2024 but this is you know, we, you think of Martin Wallace, you think of heavy games often and sometimes like war games, heavy train games and everything. But this one is designed specifically to be accessible and also to be accessible, but also to try to bring new people into the hobby with 
having kind of a different look to train games and a different feel to train games. So one of the things with this game, at least on the, the crowdfunding edition, is that you instead of a game board, you'll have these like kind of silk game board mats, like they're silk cloths. And the they did this with Bloodstones, which I think was a Kickstarter game uh, Martin Wallace designed that is, you know, so I think that maybe that was that inspired it um, after having those cloth mats and feeling like, you know, hey, this is like a different kind of tactile experience to playing. And the other benefit is you can have five maps in the game box really easily, you know. So and I think that is the plan. But this is a chain game where on your turn, you can perform two actions and they're very simple. I think it's like you can lay tracks, you can build factories and you can fulfill contracts. I think it's like those three things when you lay tracks, it's like a game like, uh, I don't know, Railways of the World or something where you put out two track tiles and then you put your train token on it to mark that it's your tracks. But one of the things that he's they're planning to do with this game is if you've ever played brass with those really nice clay chips for money, they're planning to make the track tiles like something like that, I think, out of that clay material. So they're going to be these like really nice feeling track tiles. And then I think often when you think of a game, maybe that you're laying tracks with a train game, they're usually like heavier games like 18xx, some cube rail games and such. But this one is very, uh, very light. So the other thing you could do is you can build factories. So I think there are three different types of factories you can build on the board. And when the minute you build a factory, it'll stack up with, I think, six matching resources. And there's like three different color resources, like coal, something silver. Maybe there was white and orange. I don't remember exactly. But you can build a factory. It'll put some resources on the board. Once those resources are on the board, they're public. So anybody can use them. But... If the factory, if they have to go through your train, they have to go through like one of your links, they have to pay you money. So you're kind of trying to build these factories in a way that they're, you know, you can use them for free, but other players have to pay you money to build them. And you're collecting resources to um, fulfill contracts. And the contracts are little like domino tiles and when you fulfill a contract, it usually gives you like more money and, and usually a bonus action. So you're really trying to operate efficiently by, you know, getting resources as cheaply as possible, fulfilling these contracts to give you more actions and get like kind of an action uh, engine going on. But it's like, it's really, really straightforward. It doesn't take that long to play. Really like competitive and... um you know, very like deep decisions with like how you're building your roots on the board. But again, like very light in terms of rules. Like you could explain this in five minutes to just about anyone who has at least a little bit of board game experience, but like even like it'll be a great kind of family game. And I think the plan is to do, again, the nice game found edition with the the clay track tiles and nice components in the silk cloth. But like, I think they're wanting to do a retail edition that's cardboard at some point as well, too. So that was like one of the Martin Wallace games that I played a prototype of. Are you a brass fan or, or train game kind of guy, uh, Tim? <laughs> I like brass and I am I would not say I'm a train train game type of person. The theme doesn't particularly interest me, um, but I've enjoyed some. I like most of the Martin Wallace's games that I've played, but I actually have an important question for you because you said this yes. is a prototype. Now, I, I ran into him in the elevator. I saw him in the elevator and he was carrying a prototype box and on it, it said Brass Scotland. Was that a different game? Did you get to play Brass Scotland or oh. do you know anything about that? Or is that a big spoiler? Should we not be, talk I, I not be mentioning I, that? I, I think... I think that was a, um, I know some things about that, but I can't speak of them. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I figured, you know, he was carrying it in a public space and I'm not under N on any NDA. So I'll just yeah, yeah. that little Fair spoiler. Enough. <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah, I will say I know something, but I'm not going to say anything. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of Martin's prototypes that I got to play was, uh, it's a game called Animal Rules Football. 
And this is like a two player, like kind of a lane based combat style game where there's something in the middle, like think of like battle line and you, you know, you're, you're playing against one person. They're playing a card on their side. I'm playing a card on my side in, you know, and we're vying for this center card. So this game has asymmetric Australian animal decks and we are playing and we're competing for these field cards which are mostly points, but they also, some of them give you other bonuses. So (laughs) Martin was playing as the kangaroos. I was playing as the koalas. It was really cool. Even with the, I think, I think he has so far six or eight decks in the works, but like, it was really cool to kind of just see the asymmetry between the koalas versus the kangaroos. Like the kangaroos had effects where like after a card is played, you know, in front of one field card, it could hop over and move, you know, move somewhere else. You can trigger kind of effects like that. But it was like, it it was wild because again, it reminds me, I love like card games. I love like two player, like, you know, combat kind of card battler games. And it reminded me of something like that, but with a really like refreshing theme of these, these athletic Australian animals. Um, So I'm very curious to like kind of, hear more about that one there's i i know it's just in the works i don't know the the publishing plans just yet on that but um yeah it's it's cool to see martin kind of like stepping out of his heavy game wheelhouse and like trying some more accessible trying his hand at more accessible designs uh yeah. but i think yeah, that sounds yeah, fun. yeah it, it was it was quite fun and then the other game I'll mention that I played of Martin Wallace's was what is, uh, he didn't have a title for it. He was just calling it uh, Chinese Whist. Um, but it was a trick-taking game with tiles, you, not tiles, but like wooden blocks, small wooden square blocks. So all of your opponents can see the colors of the suits that you have, but they can't see what's on your side because it's facing you. And... When you play a trick, everybody puts one of their um, one of their their tiles in face down, and then we reveal them all. And you can play whatever you want, but the the way it resolves is that first of all, if anybody played a zero and they were the only one to play a zero, they will win the trick. Otherwise, it's like kind of standard trick taking rules. If there is, or was it? I'm trying to remember if it was the highest number because i remember the shape on the tile would break kind of ties um i don't remember exactly but the point is on the on the table you'll have these eight scoring tiles for the round eight or so scoring tiles and they kind of vary so in this game you're trying to have the most life or the most like health points so everybody starts with you know a certain amount of hearts which we just use like black discs and um And then there are certain tricks where, let's say, whoever wins it gets two hearts. Cool, that's good. And whoever gets second place gets one heart. Other tricks are whoever wins it gets two uh, skull and crossbones. So that means you're losing life. And so you're like, you have this mix of some, some hands you're playing to avoid tricks. Some of them you're trying to win. And that kind of changes from round to round. Uh, but I'm very excited to kind of see where that goes because I love trick-taking games and I thought it felt like kind of just different. And I like that, you know, uh, Oink has the new game Tiger and Dragon. Like I like these trick-taking games that are going and not using cards because I'm like I'm all about that tactile experience. I love cards though, but but it's just cool to do something a little different. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, I think that's that sounds really fun. And I'm wondering now if we're gonna in the future we're gonna look back and say this is Martin Wallace's block phase because he's using blocks for his trick taker, <laughs> he's using blocks for his train tracks and his train game, and he did Bloodstones last year where it was blocks for his his yeah. combat components. So uh, I wonder if he just ended up with a bunch of extra blocks and is trying to find good ways to use <laughs> games, or if he's just like you know thinks like, hey, this is a like people like these blocks, so let's let's do more. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, that's a good observation. And then I guess just a couple other prototypes that I played that I want to just throw out real quick. Ross, A Dance of Love. This is a new dice drafting game um, designed by Mahir Shah. 
and Shalene Harlaka. Um, it's going to be coming out in Arcane Wonders. I think they're targeting as an Essen release next year, uh, so in 2024, uh, if not probably late next year at some point. But it was it's a really cool game because it's all about the Garba Ras style of dancing um, from India, and you're drafting dice, and you have these seven discs on the board. So like the table presence when you walk by, even just like looking at the prototype of this, you're going to stop and say, like, what is that? So you have these seven discs, uh, six going around a center one, and they're all kind of interlocked with these gears. And each board has a bunch of dice on them, and it's representing people dancing. Um, so you're like in a ballroom kind of situation dancing. And so it's another game where you're simultaneously selecting an action, and not an action card, but you're selecting which area which disc you're going to draft a card or draft a die from not a card um and then you flip them over at the same time and then so there's like there's a lot of like what Mahir pointed out was like simultaneous thinking in this game so you know so the downtime is really low because everybody's thinking about the same thing at the same time and then the actions are like really really quick but you're trying to like draft these dice and then you're trying to get cubes that match to, that match the color of the die. And there's a whole thing where if two discs, if two dice are pointing to each other, you're like matchmaking. If they have the same number, I believe, if the dice have the same number and it's one and it's the disc that you pulled a die from, you get to bump up on this love track and you get these bonuses. And uh, it was really cool. We played the easy version of it. Like there was a little more to it, like a more advanced game. That sounded cool too, but I like that it was like I love the theme and like the theme, yeah. like how the theme is integrated with it, and also it's like a very like medium light game with what you're doing, but it, it like had some brain burnery moments, and then of course like I often didn't care super much what my opponents were doing because I say you're you're drafting dice, but you're not like stopping someone from taking a die like if we both pick the you know the same disc to take a die from oh yeah that was the thing everybody has like an area of each disc so even if we pull from the same disc we are taking different dice because it's the one that's pointed at you okay. um, but even still you don't take the die off of the disc you just take one from the supply and say i'm getting a purple four you know yeah it sounds really cool, Candice. And the way you described it, it sounds like they really like they they wanted this theme, and they found a way to make not only the mechanisms kind of tie into it, but but the visuals. It almost sounds like yeah. you said it. It's like you're looking at a dance floor and seeing the dancers move around. I, and they're moving around. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm I'm gonna definitely take a look at this game. That sounds really cool. Yeah, and I'm very curious to see like how the um, the final production is going to turn out. <laughs> Because I'm like, this seems like it's going to be expensive to make, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Kickstarter, hopefully Kickstarter for... Well, Arcade yeah. Wonders doesn't usually do stuff on Kickstarter, though, do they? No, no, no. This is not going to be crowdfunded. Yeah, this okay. is going to be out at... like they're. I think they're targeting Essen. And there was another thing where like each round there's a tempo. So any die matching that value on your board that you've gotten throughout the whole game that matches the tempo, you get like little bonuses. and oh, neat. yeah. It was cool. And then um, I played a prototype of Galactic Cruise. I don't know if you heard about that one, um, but it's- Yeah, I saw an, you playing that. That's a big, uh, it's got a big Eno Tool artwork on the cover of the box, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. really cool Eno Tool artwork. Um, the I was playing a prototype. This is something that is going to crowdfunding, I believe maybe in March or something next year. But it's designed by TK King, Dennis Northcott, Colton Thompson, and it's pub being published by Kinsing Key Games. And uh, it's this is a heavy Euro game. And I'm going to tell you, like, if you didn't tell me who the designers were, I would have said this is a Vital Lacerda game. Like, it has such a, and it, you know, the Eno Tool artwork kind of helps that. But, like, yeah. it definitely, even if it didn't have Eno Tool artwork, I feel like it's got some serious, like, Lacerda feels in a, in a good way, in a good way. Um, but the premise is you're like you're building and launching these space shuttles to send um, different guests on, you know, luxurious space vacations. And so 
it has like that Lacerda thing where it's like, oh, it's easy. On your turn, you just either place a worker and perform two actions or you pull back your workers and get income. But like there's so there's so many hard decisions that come with that, you know, that simplicity. And, you know, you're going to be like acquiring blueprints to build up spaceships and you can build multiple spaceships. Then you're going to be trying to attract the right guests to it by like kind of color matching. Um, One of the things I loved about it was that all of the different rooms for the spaceships, like there was like a wine tasting room, a movie theater, like all these things that added this like really fun flavor. And it made you when you're kind of deciding, especially as rookies to the game, when you're deciding like, oh, what? do I want to put in my spaceship? You're just like looking, oh, what do I want to synergize with this room? You know, (laughs) if I have a casino, maybe I want wine tasting, you know? (laughs) So I I really liked uh, that aspect about it. Um, And I think, you know, we had a little bit of a bumpy game just because um, the guy who I'm really appreciative who taught us had just stepped in. Like there was someone there who was like the, I think, official demoer for the game. But he had been demoing all day and we so we had someone come in and he had only played it once, uh, you know, a TTS. So this is not the kind of game that you want to play unless, you know, someone knows the rules, you know. So we there were a couple goofs like rules goofs and but like it still gave us all a good feel for it. And I think I think this is going to be a banger for people who like those heavy Lacerda ish games. You know, well, I'll tell you, if you ever put me on a galactic cruise, there better be wine tasting because I'm <laughs> not going to be sitting there sober. You could have you could have been on my spaceship then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the last one that I'll drop in this uh, in this little category of unreleased games. I played this game that's going to be called Wilmot's Warehouse, and it's actually based on a video game. And the board game is being is designed by David King. And CMYK is going to be publishing it around quarter four next year, so late next year. And uh, it's still under development, and it's based on this video game, which I knew nothing about the video game at the time. But this is how I describe this game, because it was like one of my favorite games that I played the whole weekend. It's cooperative memory with storytelling. So, yeah, think about that for a second. You just said a lot of words that I... (laughs) That scared me away. (laughs) Tell me why I wouldn't want to play this game. Okay, I'll tell you why. Because you have this board that is an eight by eight grid. So we, throughout the game, we are collectively, we're working together, it's cooperative, going to be placing 64 tiles face down. And all these tiles have abstract art. And we place these tiles in chunks, like round by round. So round one, all you do is, in turn order, one person is going to take a tile, we're all going to look at it and we're going to like talk about like what it reminds us of. We're going to decide where it goes and place it down face down. Okay. So now it's face down. Then the next person is going to grab a tile. We're going to talk about it. And then we're going to have, we have to put it adjacent to an existing tile face down. So you're trying to tell this story because by the end of the game, you have all these face down tiles And now we have to match them to cards as fast. And there's like a timer to do it too. So we have to go back and say, okay, oh, we said the space pirates, um, the space pirates were cooking meth or whatever. Like we were (laughs) making up all sorts of like crazy stories. You know, the doctor was playing golf. So there's like something that kind of looked like a golf ball. And we know that's there. So that's, that's your goal is to be able to remember all of these tiles that you collectively put face down by matching them to cards at the end. But each round, you have this stack of tiles and the rules change. So I said the first round, you just like flip one, we can all look at it and we all like just, you know, say what we want and place it down. Next round, I I don't remember if it was the next round or a future round, but I grab a tile and you guys see it. I can't look at it. And now you have to say one word. Each person says one word. And then I have to decide where to place it face down without looking at it based on that one word that you guys used to describe it. Then at another point in the game, the whole board rotates. So that's like messing with your head and the the spatial aspect. But there are all these like rules that you'll like slightly change the game. And then you'll have to like place down like 10 tiles And then the rule will change. And now we have to place down more tiles. And you're telling this crazy story the whole time. 
And and then you're like, when he told us about this game, we thought it would be uh, James Nathan is who told me about this game and brought this to my attention. And he basically, we were like, there's no way we're going to be able to do this. But guess what, Tim? We did it. You succeeded? We did right it on. because of our crazy story we told yeah. and just like working together. But it was so fun and so different and so challenging. I I loved it. So um, this one is going to be on my radar for next year. Have you ever heard of the video game before? No, no. But I'm not a big video gamer. There's so many games being released on Steam all the time. It seems like there's yeah, like a dozen new games every week. So it's hard to keep up. When I was into video gaming 10 year, 15 years ago, I was always like you had, you know, a small handful of big releases on the console. It was easy to keep up with. But these days, there's a lot. There's a lot of new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that I don't know that world nearly as well as I knew board games. But uh, tell me more about your highlights. Well, so the the other thing I thought was really fun here was, and I didn't expect to love this. I mean, I tend to teach a lot of games with my local game groups, but I don't necessarily love teaching games. It's just something that I do because I want the groups to be successful, and you know, I want to bring people together for games. But I did get a lot of opportunities at this con to sit down and teach people games. And I found a lot of joy out of it, actually Um, getting to, you know, well, you know, because I think a lot of people are there and you could see somebody would sit down and they either just took a game out of the library or they're sitting down at the hot games table and they got to learn the game and learning a game is the worst part of this hobby. I mean, it's like, you know, (laughs) there's a time and place for it, but you don't want to sit there when you're trying to have fun and just have to sit and, you know, spend an hour and a half struggling through the rule book and figure out where things go and all this stuff. So I would see somebody sitting down to learn a heavy game. And I'm just like, let me teach that to you. It'll be a much better experience for you. And every time I did there, people were so thankful and we had such a great time. Um, so I got a chance to teach like Voidfall, which is a huge, heavy game. Some guy brought oh, it yeah. and he's like, hey, I was going to try to learn this. And I was like, no, you're not going <laughs> to learn. You will, this will take you all weekend to learn. Let me help yeah. you with this. So I taught Voidfall to a few guys. I taught oh, uh, one saint. of my favorite games. <laughs> I taught one of my favorite games that a lot of people have overlooked, Outlive, which is a great game from like six or seven years ago. Oh, um, never I got a chance. But you, you have heard of it or you haven't? No, I haven't heard of it. Okay, so that, you should check it out. It's a Le Boy de Joux game, and it's it's a an interesting kind of worker placement type of game, but it's based, it's a post-apocalyptic game. So it's got a really, one of the most thematic Euro games I've ever played, and it still holds cool. up. It's a lot of good tension and stuff. So I got to introduce some people to that game. Um, Scythe, I, a guy was sitting down with his brand new open copy of Scythe with the teachers wanted and players wanted Scythe. And I just, Scythe was one of my first you know, really exciting entries into this hobby. And so I sat down and three other people showed up. All of them had said, like, I've always wanted to learn this and never got into it. And so I taught four new players side. We had a great game. And so it was just it was it was a just a it's an experience I'll be looking for my next con, something I didn't even think I'd be wanting to do this time. But one of the games I got to introduce three new players to was Clank Catacombs. Now, I love Clank. I am a very big fan of Clank. Um, I just think it creates some fun, fun moments every single time you play it. And Clank Catacombs is my favorite version of it. And if you if you haven't played, so Clank Catacombs basically takes the Clank format, which is a deck builder where you're basically trying to move around a dungeon based on the cards that come out of your, in your deck. And at the same time, you're accidentally creating noise and that noise will get you attacked by this dragon that's protecting the dungeon. <laughs> well, Catacombs changes that a little bit by by making the dungeon modular where every time you move into a new space you reveal a tile off the top of a deck and you're going to see what's in there you're going to see what rooms are in there so it really makes it more dynamic and you can't plan too much in advance but it just creates more fun moments in the game anyway i've been playing dune imperium with somebody a couple days earlier and mentioned how paul denon even though he's got a very small library is one of my favorite designers and he, the guys like yeah. i've never played clank and i said we got to rectify that so we we got we got a couple people uh you know three people to to learn it with with him and um they had a blast and it was so much fun it was one of these games where like you know if you've ever played clank you know there's moments where all of a sudden you realize it's dire and if you don't get out or if you don't get to the safe space in the dungeon (laughs) very soon you're gonna die and we had three of us that were almost there and one person had just gotten out so that means she starts pulling the cubes out of the bag on her turn. So it's getting even more risky. 
two of us were about to move into the same the safe space and one of the cards comes up that says rotate the tile you're on by 180 degrees <gasps> so both oh, of us got no. completely turned around and oh, had, no. to, had to work our way back we both barely made it into the safe space a few turns later but both died there and still managed to score just about as much as the person who escaped so it was a very tight screen game <laughs> the one guy that got knocked out completely that didn't even score he was having such a blast. He was, he's apparently an RPG player, and he was having such a fun time talking through the narrative and adding story oh, to everything that, that was happening that That's he great. just made the game fun for everybody, uh, even though he got knocked out, you know, which slightly before the end. Uh, Clank Catacombs, fantastic game. If you don't mind a little bit of luck, a little bit of randomness in your game, and you want some fun, push your luck, tension, that's got tons of fun theme in it. Um, I would recommend checking this out. If you've played Clank in the past, this is, uh, like I said, I think the best Game version changer. of Clank. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. It's so good. So anyway, that was one of the ones that I got to teach and got to really see people have a great time with it. And that was that was really fun for me. Oh, that's so cool. And yeah, I totally agree. Like Clank Catacombs is like, yes. Like I, lo- I love games where you're exploring and flipping tiles. And yeah. Clank always has like a spot in my heart because it's just like I love deck building games that are also where board games that are incorporated with deck building and yeah, totally. that was one that i played early on like i love the uh, clank legacy and everything and uh yeah clank catacombs i've only played it once but it was uh really really fun and i can't really see playing the other versions <laughs> after exactly. it, after it you know <laughs> yep yeah my my other clank versions left my house as soon as clank catacombs <laughs> came in and I'm, I'm happy to keep revisiting this one it's a great game though yeah Totally. So back on episode seven of this podcast, I was on with Cole Worley and I rem- I think it was on this podcast or it might have been just in conversation, but he mentioned whenever he goes to BGG Con, one of his favorite things is to kind of like dig in the library for some like old, like quirky game and just kind of try it out. So I was excited that he and Drew were there this year um, and I was walking by to go meet some friends Matt and I were, and we bumped into Cole and Drew, and they had this game called Shifty Eyed Spies in their hand, and they looked like they were like, let's play this game. So we ended up sitting down to play this game. This is a 2017 release designed by the um, the crew at Prospero Hall crew, which is like a design studio with like a lot of different designers. It's published by Big G Creative, and it plays with four to eight games. So we sat down, Matt, Cole, Drew, and I, and played a four-player game. And we were waiting for some uh, other friends to kind of finish a game and to play a a larger game of it. And let me tell you, you know, Cole explained the rules. And then once we got going, I could not stop laughing. So in this game, you have these four locations. You have a fountain, a cafe, a metro, and a newsstand. And you have, they're like um, these 3D kind of cardboard pieces. So you'll put them on the table. um, You'll spread them out in the corners of the table. And everyone has a character uh, in front of them. And um, in your hand, you will draw two cards. One card is going to be a character card, not your own. Um, So one of your opponent's characters. And one is going to be a location. And you are basically trying to signal to the person whose character card you have and you want to signal very discreetly to them by by winking and blinking your eyes and then once you have their attention they need to signal to you the location that they have the location card in their hand so like maybe I look over at Cole and I kind of like subtly wink to him And then he gets my wink. And then now he's like kind of eyeing over at the fountain. So there's little briefcases passing around. And when the briefcase comes to you, you can kind of kind of complete a mission. I forget what the the verbiage is. But I would say in that case, I'm meeting Cole at the fountain. And then I take out my my card of Cole's character. He takes out his card of the fountain. And we get to score those. So we put those face down in front of us. Now, <laughs> what's I, that was the easy scenario there. But what's really going to happen is everybody is looking at each other because you're try- everybody's trying to signal to each other. But everybody has these binoculars, which you can throw in that are interception tokens. So if, let's say, Drew saw me being really obviously winking at Cole, 
he throws an interception token and says, I saw Candace looking at Cole. I reveal the character card I have. If it's Cole, then Drew gets to score that. If he's wrong, then I get to score it. But you only have three of these like intercept tokens. And it's, this game is just hilarious. Then we played with eight players, a couple games with eight players. And everybody's just like kind of like looking around and you're just laughing and giggling so much. So I, I played this game and I was like, I have to get this game. And of course, it's not really available anymore. Although there's probably a way you can kind of like proxy your own version. But I did find one copy on Noble Knights and I bought it. And it was like a little Thanksgiving miracle because it showed up the day after Thanksgiving and our friends were still over. We were playing some games with them and they're lighter gamers. And I'm like, before you leave, we have to play this game. And of course, as soon as I break it out and we just start playing that first round and everybody gets what's going on, this winking and blinking around the table, everybody's just cracking up. And there's just like something very magical about this game. And it's just so silly and funny. And uh, I'm happy to own it. But like, if I couldn't find it, I would probably would have proxied my own version of it. Um, that's not, that have, sounds amazing, yeah. Candice. That sounds like such a fun experience <laughs> and so unique. I, I can't even think of another yeah. game that, that has that kind of silly, fun interaction. That, like, that's, yeah. that's great. I, I, I could not either. So I'm glad that uh, the Whirly Brothers brought that to my attention. And now I have a copy of it if anyone ever comes over and wants to like wink at each other. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. All right. Well, hold that. If you come to Board Game Geek Con next year and I'm going to be there, well, let's, uh, let's see if we can get a yes. game of that in. That would be a blast. Absolutely. That's a perfect con it's going to, yes, it's totally a perfect con game. Yes. If you, next time you make it, let's, let's make sure we play that together. That is Shifty right Eyed Spies. Well, speaking of fun party experiences, that was the last type of experience I want to mention today. And that is one of the fun things about being at a con. Uh, and I happen to know some people that were there and they, they this is their kind of their experience every time is that late at night, they bust out party games and you start to get big groups of people that are getting together and playing these silly fun games after we've been playing heavy euros all day. And uh, that's what I got to do a lot of this weekend. So I get to play some great ones. Like I got an eight player game of challengers in, got to play a goofy game of ricochet robots uh, played Letter nice. Jam, but my favorite was one that I had never played before. And the name, there's a reason, right? I mean, this is not a good name for a game. It's just called Fun Facts. That is not, that, <laughs> that doesn't sound fun. It doesn't sound interesting. It sounds like something that was made in 1980 and nobody should bother playing it. But I think this is by Repost Productions. Yeah, it's by Repost Productions. And it looks a lot like the box style and font style and stuff looks a lot like Just One. So I think it's kind of in that line of games that Repost makes. Um, that is designed by Casper Lap, and it was released in 2022. Plays four to eight players. The way this works, uh, really simple. Basically, you're all it's a cooperative cooperative party game. You're all sitting around the table, and the first person is going to um, basically they're going to flip over a card that's public for everybody, and it says something like, uh, "From one to a hundred, how do you fit on this scale?" So, for example, from one to a hundred, how much do you like musicals? And so that person will write on a little face down whiteboard. Um, the number that they, they might say, oh, I, I kind of like musicals. I'll put myself at a 35. And then they'll put that tile in the middle of the table. Then the person next to them writes on face their board too. and they face down and they, yeah. they decide whether they think they're higher or lower than that first person. So they'll put this either above or below it. And you keep going around the table until it comes back to the first player and that person can then move their tile. But then you start it from the bottom and you start flipping them up. And if any are out of order, they don't get the score. So if the first one flipped over, somebody that you know they hate musicals. They've talked about it before. So they put a zero down there. Everyone knew they were going to be zero. <laughs> Easy. The next one turns out to be like a 15. Okay, great. We still get to score that one. But the next one, somebody put a 10. Well, they don't get to score because they were higher than the one below them. And I played this with five people who knew each other pretty well. And they didn't really know me very much at all. I just met them the day before. So I was like, oh, this is a lot about what you know about the people around you. How is this going to work? And it was so fun. It was great. It worked great. It was so fun to both like see what kind of preconceptions people had of me and what kind of preconceptions I had of them and how that fit into this puzzle. But also we learned a ton of fun stuff because every time we'd finish, they would be like, really? You you like gardening? You rated yourself a 95 <laughs> on gardening. And then, you know, you get to hear a little story about them and why they're into that. There was one question, I think it was something like, instead of a one to a hundred, it was like, what age would you want to spend the rest of your life as? And that just resulted uh, in a ton of fun conversations. Like some people yeah. were like, 
20 because I know my knees never hurt when I was 20 years old and somebody else is like <laughs> 37 because that's the last time somebody looked at me with like, you know, like googly eyes, yeah. like they found me attractive. <laughs> so, so it was just, a, it was fun, super fun conversations. I'm going to be picking this one up. We have a good group of people around here that play party games and this is going to be in our regular rotation for sure. So I would recommend if you like a fun party game, four to eight players, fun facts is great. Yeah. And I, the, I was, I'm, I was going to ask you too, uh, you know, before you mentioned it, like if you played with people you knew or strangers, because I've played this one, I think twice or twice or so. And I think it is really interesting because it's a game where, yeah, you can kind of like learn stuff about each other, but then it's like fun conversations and like thought provoking, like, uh, yeah, like where you're thinking like, I know you like musicals, but I don't know if I like them more than you, yeah. you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could at least, even if, even if you don't know the other people, you can at least rank yourself to some extent and say like, Hey, I don't know yeah. all these people, but I bet I'm somewhere in the middle or I think I'm way at the top here and, you know, like take a good guess at it. So it, it was fun. Even if, I think even if you played with six strangers, I think it'd still be a fun time. Cool, cool, cool. Fun facts. So the last game on my list is a game, and uh, <laughs> duh. But um, it is a game. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is something. Um, so Derek Porter, who's a video editor for VGG and a friend of mine, we have been talking about. We both like card games, and we he has been wanting to teach me KeyForge forever, and I like wanted to teach him Flesh and Blood at some point. And every time we, we see each other at a convention, which is only like once, maybe twice a year, he brings Keyforge decks. We never get to play it. So this time, we finally got the opportunity to play Keyforge, and I loved it. I have not stopped thinking about Keyforge since the first game. And okay, so... Keyforge, I'm late to the party here. This originally came out in 2018. We played for my first two games, um, the newest set called Winds of Exchange, because this is kind of a card battler fantasy themed game designed by Richard Garfield, who designed Magic the Gathering. And it was originally published by Fantasy Flight Games, and now it's published by Ghost Galaxy. And it's a two player game where each player is going to be playing a unique deck of cards. Every deck that you can get for Keyforge is algorithmically generated and 100% unique. Like, Tim, you and I might have decks that have some of the same cards, but our combination of cards within our deck is 100% unique, uh, which is a really cool aspect of the game because, you know, when it comes to games like Flesh and Blood and Magic and everything you can get into this space of um, beyond just like spending a lot of money to get cool cards, but you can find out like, oh, Tim's got this. He just won a tournament with such and such deck. Now I'm just going to buy all those cards and I'm going to try to play Tim's deck. It's like, you can't yeah. do that with this. You can try to find decks that you like and try to play them the best you can. But I really like that about it. But the thing I like about it most is that instead of a card kind of battler game where we are just trying to reduce each other's life to zero first, we're trying to kill each other, in this game, you are racing to forge three keys first. And the way you forge keys is by having this resource called amber. And at the beginning of your turn, if you have six amber, the, the that cost may change from card play, but if you have six you're going to get to forge a key and flip this big little token over. I just said big little, but uh, it's kind of a big token. It looks cool. Um, but you flip it over. You say, I forged a key. Cool. Awesome. So you're racing to be the first to to, to um, forge three keys. So I love that, like that you're trying to generate this resource that's going to let you generate these keys and you're racing to do it. But in the meantime, we're definitely going to try to interfere with each other because you're racing to do it. I'm racing to do it. So on your turn, well, first of all, the deck that you play, each deck is going to have three different houses. So Keyforge at this point has, I don't know, maybe eight or ten different houses and different sets that were released had different combinations of houses that you might find on cards that came in those sets. But each deck, you'll have three houses and think of them as like factions that have their own little like kind of play styles to them. And... On your turn, you'll have a hand of cards 
And you can only activate one house on your turn. So, you know, maybe you have three cards from one house, two cards from another, one card for one. You know, you might say, oh, well, I have three cards from this house, so I'm going to choose to activate that house so I can play those cards. But there are a lot of like really cool hand management decisions because maybe that house that you have, mo you know, the most cards in isn't going to like help move the needle this round. Like maybe it doesn't make sense to play them. But I like that restriction. Like cards don't have a cost. You don't have to spend any resource to play a card, but you just have to pick one of the houses to activate. So then you pick that card. You can like any cards that you've already played out into your tableau. Um, you can activate cards of that matching house. You can discard cards from your hand from that house only. And you can play cards. And there are creatures, which you kind of play into a battle line in front of you. There are artifacts, um, which go below your creatures. And they're kind of, they give you some kind of like cool benefit. But it also could be giving your opponent a benefit as well. And then you have action cards, which are just like trigger it and, um, and discard it. Between all the different houses and the different card effects and the hand management restrictions and the racing element where it's like, I'm not just trying to kill your, your, your hero or something like that. I'm trying to beat you to getting the amber that I need to trigger the end of the game first. And I friggin' love it. Like, I love it. I've already bought mo more decks. I had like every night before I go to bed, I've been watching Keyforge content. I don't know what took me so long to try this game, <laughs> but I, I really, really like it. Have you played yeah. any Keyforge or card games? No, like and this? I, this is something I've got to fix because I'm a longtime Magic the Gathering player. I played competitively for like 15, 20 years. And um, so obviously I know Richard Garfield's designs and I love his card games. And the main reason this hasn't gotten played is just because I don't play a lot of two-player games except with my wife and she's not into card games. But I've been playing with some people a little bit more two player recently, so I'm I want to pick up a couple of decks of this. I've always been interested. In it. it sounds great. My favorite way to play Magic was never doing constructed decks where you're kind of like you know going and finding all the cards and making a deck, but uh, what they used to call limited, where you just open a sealed or a few sealed pack of cards and just work yeah. with that limited set. So it's not the most powerful cards, but it's finding the right fun combinations with the cards that you happen to get out. And Keyforge sounds like it just is going to hit on that without all the expense of having to buy new cards all the time. So yeah. sounds super fun. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you really liked it. It definitely makes me more tempted to give it a shot. Yeah, and, and, and that is, you bring up a good point. Like a lot of card games like this will have like deck building. Like I like Ashes Reborn. I usually just play like whatever the default decks are. Um, I don't feel like I've ever been very good at like that, like Arkham Horror and everything I play. I'm like, I'm doing deck building as we play through scenarios, but I don't, that's not my jam just yet with any of these games. And it's not like a strength of mine. I know some people love that. Cause it's like, it's a game before the game kind of like, you know, it's a creative little project, but this is just so nice that you can just, yeah, here's a deck. Yeah, here's a it. deck. Let's, let's yeah. play. And you could play love that it. same deck for a while and just try to like, you know, get familiar with the cards in it. And yeah. So I'm also happy Matt likes it too. So, you know, it's, it's good. I just, yeah. Keyforge. <laughs> I really like it. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Cool. Yeah. Check it out. Um, but anyway, Tim, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that like your very first BGG con was like, like it sounded really cool. It's, it's yeah. always like a really cool experience for me. And, you know, I know we talked about doing this, like this episode together months ago so i'm glad we finally did it <laughs> it was a great experience and great to, to join you here candace and if anyone wants to hear more about my experience we did just record an episode on it so by the time this releases you'll be able to find it in our podcast feed um, and i went into even more detail on some of the games we played and some of the experiences there but cool. super fun i hope to be back next year and uh again thanks for having me on the show it was a great time and, and love chatting with you about it and great to see you in person there as well that was really, really yeah neat. Yeah, thanks again for being here. And like next time we're both there, shifty eyed spies, you know? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm in. <laughs> You've been listening to the Board Game Geek podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at boardgamegeek.com. 
You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at boardgamegeek.com. Thanks for listening and happy gaming. Thank you.